Greetings, comrades, and hello, everyone. I'm Quinn866. Welcome to the third episode of the Anime Memories Retrospective. By now, we should all know the stupidly long review of Wild Arms Twilight Venom, aka WATV, this anime right here. I mean, I uh, didn't really show the box off that much, but uh, the box is good. You know, it's got the multiple, um, you know, discards. It, it, it's actually a, a pretty good box on all things considered, but uh, I just figured I'd show that because I didn't really show the box art in that one. And actually, to further add insult to injury, uh, I also didn't show the box art of Trigun at all. So uh, this is the box art as well to prove that I do own the physical copies. So, uh, yeah. But, um... Since I've reviewed both of these animes for the first two episodes of this retrospective, I figured it'd probably be best for the next episode to cover something that is not a sci-fi western. I mean, this is the anime memories retrospective, not the western sci-fi memories retrospective. Not only does that not sound as cool and probably wouldn't be as entertaining, but that title doesn't roll off the tongue very well, so... <laughs> And this is why I'll be covering a new genre in this episode. One you probably might not expect me to even remotely give a shot. We all know the magical girl genre, right? <laughs> yep, I know. I know what you're thinking. What? Quinn 866, you actually watched the magical girl anime? Well, to be fair, I did explain this a bit in the Trigun introduction when I referred to the sibling anime tradition between me and my brother and sister. I had watched some animes with my brother, some animes with my sister, and some where all three of us siblings teamed up together to watch And One of the animes I watched with my sister was Sailor Moon, and I had watched the entire series with her. Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon R, Sailor Moon S, Sailor Moon Super S, and Sailor Moon Superstars. And I watched the DIC slash Cloverfield, or Cloverway, uh, the, the old dub, so I know all the old dubs. I have yet to watch the Viz dub, though, so who knows? I might have to do that, and maybe I'll review Sailor Moon in the future. Who knows? Like this video, share, subscribe, and comment down below begging me to review Sailor Moon if you want me to do that. But if this doesn't get enough views, I'm obviously not going to do it. <laughs> but uh, obviously I'm not reviewing Sailor Moon here right now. Now, with that context out of the way, I do have a bit of a guilty pleasure for some Magic Girl animes, but most of it is, again, out of nostalgia for just kind of reminding me of the fun time I had with my sister. And that is why, when going into this anime, A Card Captive Sakura, my thoughts and expectations were set pretty low. I mean, understandably so, as this is definitely a lot younger looking than Sailor Moon, and also, probably is a lot younger of a target audience to boot. Now, to be fair, I have seen other magical animes prior to seeing this. Like I said, Sailor Moon, I saw Wedding Peach, the entirety of Nana 707, and Little Witch Academia. Now, each of those shows had their charm, but they were still pretty run-of-the-mill magical animes that had some standout moments, but not enough for me saying it was worth binging. And again, I had the same expectation in mind when going into Card Captor Sakura. I was expecting to find some stuff to latch on to, but for the most part, it being just kind of eh, because I'm not the target audience. Although, after coming out of it and watching all three arcs, I can say I'm pleasantly surprised by how well it held up, especially when, again, my thoughts and expectations were set really, really low from the get-go. However, if I were to view all three arcs in this one video, this would probably be longer than the WATV 5-hour edition, so this is why I'll be covering the first arc, the Cloak Heart arc, in this video. Also, just a quick heads up, I'm going to be reviewing the modern dub, as the Nelvana slash Card Captors dub isn't the complete story and definitely leaves out a lot, so yeah, just wanted to point that out. So, with that said and out of the way, let's try not wasting more time like I did before and get this intro done with. Oh, review, created by Quint and his clones. By the power of our contract, I command you, reveal your true form to me. Release! <laughs> oh my 
God, that probably sounded terrible and cringy coming out of a 21-year-old's mouth. Okay, that conceals the power of darkness. Reveal your true nature to me. I command you by the power given to me. Bottoms up. <sighs> A classic combo, blinker fluid and goldfish. Anyways, sorry for me snacking off to the side this early. This is because I want to make sure my throat is nice and good, because there is a lot to say about the characters, surprisingly. <laughs> Cardcaptor Sakura, as you can tell, is intended for a younger audience. Like a decent chunk of media intended for a lighter crowd, it has a very generic cast, at first glance. It does have its complications here and there, but in all honesty, this is a pretty by-the-books character cast when it comes down to the characters and even their personalities themselves. To be fair, we have almost every role filled in for the magical girl anime starter kit. It's got your everyday normal girl turned magical who goes from wimp to warrior, that being the protagonist, obviously, the card captor herself, Sakura Kinemoto. We have the best friend of Sakura Kinemoto, the card captor, who acts as the motivation and knows she has magic very early on. She's also a really good character, that being Tomoyo Daioji. Of course, Sakura Kinemoto has a family, and she has an older brother that tends to tease her a lot, causing the childish rivalry stuff you'd expect from these kind of animes, but he is a caring character at the end of the day, that being Toya Kinemoto. Toya is often seen with another classmate, and his best friend, as well as Sakura's initial crush, that being this guy right here named Yukido Sukashiro. There's also the teacher at the school who's both smart and a bit strange since she also works as a shrine maiden, that being Kaho Miyuzuki. Sakura's father is often the voice of reason, and most of the time the person that breaks up the arguments and banter between Sakura and Toya, and is overall just a nice guy, that being Fujikara Kinemoto. Sakura's mother has unfortunately passed away, but she does live on as a good memory for all the family members, whether it be Toya, Fujikara, or of course Sakura herself. I also like it that she appears in angel form, which is pretty nice for a guardian mother figure, that being Nadashiko Kinemoto. In magic girl animes, there needs to be an explanation, source, or cause of all the magic, that being the long gone wizard, Clo Reed. There is, of course, a mascot who acts as a guide to those who don't know too much about magic in this universe, who does have his cool moments, his funny moments, and even some moments that are just plain cute to begin with, and he even has his own little character arc, that being the guardian of the sun, Kiro Chan. Sakura isn't the only one out there to capture the cards though, as there is another person who has magic who wants to capture the cards for his own reasons, that being the rival figure, who has his own character arc and, as you can probably guess when I was talking about Yukido earlier, eventually becomes the main romantic interest for Sakura, this being the boy from Hong Kong, Xiao Ran Li. However, as I said earlier, he becomes the romantic interest since we have to deal with a sibling who has a crush on him, oddly enough, and does want to help him with the clo cards, despite being strictly a physical fighter due to not having much magic and is a bit of a brat, that being Mei Ling Li. Now there are more characters, but I'll get to them when I go into the story and episode pacing, and I'll only be covering characters that are important in this arc, as revealing characters with significance later on will kind of take out the <coughs> MAGIC! 
I am so sorry. That was totally uncalled for. However, in CCS, which is what I'll abbreviate Car Captor Sakura to from now on, so I don't have to say it over and over and over, and also so I can read the script correctly, I should probably touch on one more topic before getting into more of the characters individually, as CCS is widely known for its large collection of LGBTQTB relationships. Now, me personally, I've always appreciated animes that try to do this. It's not easy giving censors and with all the overgeneralizations of animes representing, betraying gay, lesbian, queer, transgender, and pansexual relationships, they often kind of can be a bit taken offensively. Now, not all the time, but there are people that might take it the wrong way. And when you think LGBTQTP in Cardcaptor Sakura, you probably are thinking, what? Are you serious? How on earth can you even remotely get away with adding LGBTQTP relationships to an anime about a 10-year-old magic lolly? Well, I will say, to the anime's credit, CCS makes this work with nearly every relationship being romantic and not sexual in almost any way. This is excellent due to the fact that you're not gonna make it on TV if you have a 10 year old magic lolly going and simping over a high school dude, let's be real here. And the politics would not make it easy and it would go out of control if it were sexual, which thankfully it is not. I mean, I'm so glad that it's not sexual in almost every sense. Of course, for the younger characters. There are some sexual implications with the adult characters, but, like, there's very few of those, obviously. Furthermore, it's just nice to see an anime focus on romance-focused relationships than the overabundance of sexual relations. I mean, think about it. We kind of need more animes that have romance without the sexual stuff, and I think CCS does this pretty darn good. So, credit to you, CCS. However, in fairness to the Pride community, most of these relations aren't canonically true, like Sakura and her best friend Tomoyo, for instance. Tomoyo has feelings for Sakura, clearly in both the anime and the manga. Although, I do appreciate Tomoyo taking Sakura's friendly interactions willingly, even if the romance is likely never gonna happen. Sakura's intended romance is supposed to be with Shaoran Lee, obviously. In fact, Sakura originally had a crush on Yukito, but that was debunked when it revealed that Yukito and Toya, the older brother of Sakura, were already together. The relationship between Toya and Yukito is one of the few canon relations that falls under this category, so there are canon ones for those who want it. In fact, Shaoran actually used to have strange feelings for Yukito as well. These were at first taken as a crush, since he didn't quite know how to deal with it, but it's later revealed the feelings were not of romance, but rather Shaowan's strong internal magic reacting to Yukito, who had a bit of magic as well. Even though it is a little weird to think Shaowan interpreted this strange sensation as romance at first, I will admit it is a little funny to go back and see him break character and just be an absolute doof around Yukito once you know the details. And it is pretty cute, honestly, just to see him in all the cute animations, because Shaolin tries to be super serious all the time. I hereby award chuckle points. <laughs> Alrighty then, with the basic characters themselves out of the way and the relations, I think we can go into more details about each character individually. First, let me finish up this blinker fluid, though. I mean, it is the most normal drink of all time, and it's almost empty enough to refill it off camera. No! Let's start going more into Sakura herself. Now, as a protagonist, she's almost no different from Usagi in Sailor Moon or Momoko in Wedding Beach. Both share the I didn't sign up to be a hero gig and are also wimps to scary stuff. This didn't quite work with Usagi for me in Sailor Moon. For one, Usagi is 14 years old, and when I was 14 years old, I was still fairly soft at heart, but that didn't stop me from being full of pride and determination against my opponents. Plus, I had to survive as a 14-year-old in junior high getting shoved into lockers day after day. This is a locker, isn't it? <laughs> 
However, I find this works in the case of Sakura, since she's merely 10 years old at the start of the series, so I can understand why she'd chicken out in the presence of ghosts or caves. And unlike Sailor Moon, Sakura does actively try to avoid these instances, and when she is thrown into them, she does have the times where she uses her head to get out of it without everyone babbling her off all the time. There are times where she might need a point or two from Kira or Tomoyo, but there were a few times where Sakura faces her fear because of an idea she had. I like this, since, let's be real here, Usagi almost always relied on the cats, Tuxedo Mask, or the other Sailor Scouts to give her ideas and support. Sakura, though, has plenty of moments where she figures a way out herself, so credit there. Now, that's not to say these happen all the time, but I'm glad it happens a lot more than Sailor Moon, and I guess this just proves that a 10-year-old can be both braver and smarter than a 14-year-old. Oh! This is one thing, though, that did get me worried going into this anime, again, with my prior knowledge of magical girl animes, when Sakura uses her magic. But this anime throws another curveball, and you know what? I am so glad we don't have to deal with a full minute long overly sexualized outfit transformation scene. Now to be fair, there is about a there is another transformation scene, that being when Sakura's key turns into his staff, but this is only about 30 seconds, and it does have a few variations. With, you know, Sakura twirling it in different ways and using different cards, in addition to the outfit Sakura wears, which is what I was getting into just a few seconds ago. Because I'm gonna go on record and say Bravo, animators of Card Captain Sakura, since in almost every episode, almost every episode, Sakura has a new outfit made by Tomoyo for her clo card encounters. Now, this does sound a little trite and cliche, but think about it. From the animator's perspective, they basically had to design and animate Sakura in these new clothes for nearly 50-something-plus episodes, and that is a lot of credit. I gotta give an A++++ to the developers, since yes, they did have the manga to work off of, but the anime has more clo cards and episodes, so they couldn't just rely on all the manga's designs for the clothes, so they did inevitably have to draw a few new ones, and I got massive respect for everyone with the dev team, since I don't think it was easy to make separate outfits and new ones outright, and even recreating the old ones probably took some time as well. So bravo, animators. Plus, I will admit, it's just cute to see Sakura shyly and begrudgingly try on the clothes Tomoyo gave her so she can film her heroic deeds. Actually, let's talk about Tomoyo. Tomoyo is actually a character I relate heavily to, surprisingly. Not because of the LGBTQTP relations or me having a crush on a lolly or whatever bullcrap the comments want to make up, but it's because Tomoyo acts as the motivation for Sakura and her gang. I always kind of was the big talker and the optimistic one of my friend groups, and I relate to that heavily, in addition to Tomoyo being obsessed with making videos of Sakura in action. I mean, do I need to explain why I relate to this as a YouTuber and all? <laughs> Overall, I really like Tomoyo, she's just a good character, has fun moments, acts as a good motivation. Plus, I do like her soft side for cosplay. Well, making Sakura cosplay, that is. Now, I do always like Halloween, and as a kid, I'd always go out of my way to get the best costume I could for my parents, but as of now, as an adult, that hype is kind of dying down. Also, I will admit it is kind of cute how she makes little trinkets for Kuro as well, that kind of match up with Sakura's out. So good on you, Tomoyo. And now that I mentioned Kuro, let's cover him. Alrighty then, now it's time to cover the adorable little guardian of the sun, that being Kuro-chan. He loves sugar. He really loves sugar. He really freaking loves sugar. There's not much else to say about his personality at this rate. I do like his character arc of roping Sakura into returning all of the Clo Reed's cards into the book, not just because of his master Clo Reed, but because Kiro himself will remain in his dormant state unless he gets all of the cards back, thus allowing him to go into his true body, which is much cooler. 
I also like it that he's supposed to guard the cards. It was because of him he didn't protect them when Sakura blew them off. And his sugar gasms are cute to watch. Uh, apart from that, though, there's not too much to say about Kuro at this point in time. I have the same kind of gig with Toya and Yukito, as there's not too much to say about them at this point in time, so instead, I'll just put a good scene with both of them interacting with Sakura. Ow. Hey, what are you doing? Hurry up and come in! Uh, I'm coming! <laughs> it took a while to get my shoes off. Uh, <laughs> Hello, how are you, Sakura? <laughs> Yakito! Hello? Those look delicious. You're a good cook, aren't you, Sakura? Uh, no, not really. That's right. She's really not. Uh, <laughs> um... <laughs> Normally, these kind of sibling rivalries would get pretty annoying in animes because they're usually lopsided with one character usually winning out more than the other. But I like it that both Sakura and Toya get their moments of winning these little scuffles. So here's one where Toya kind of gets the better end of the spectrum. You're good at cleaning, Sakura. <laughs> She's not usually like this. She's normally stomping around the house like a monster. It's hard to tell whether she's cleaning or trying to destroy the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's really nice to see a cartoon slash anime or just TV show in general where the sibling rivalries are not lopsided. So I like that. Sakura's parents, Fujikara and Natashiko, I really need to add nothing more to, as I basically said all there was to say about them in the brief descriptions earlier, so on to the next one, I guess. And that next one is... Alright, now I think it's time to talk about the rivals, the Lee siblings, those consisting of Xiaoran Li and Mei Ling Li. Xiaoran is... well... Kind of a mysterious character at the start of the series. He appears in recurring dreams that Sakura has throughout the series, and I always love these dream sequences, by the way. At the end of episode 7, we see Xiaoran watching Sakura from the rooftops during her latest card capture, and then he moves into Sakura's school in episode 8. We first see that Xiaoran doesn't think too highly of Sakura, coming from Hong Kong and sharing similar magic to that of Chloe Reeds as well, thus making him want to capture the cards for himself. He has the sword and the elemental talismans to hold up pretty well as well. His sibling Mei Ling Li is a bit of a hard character to describe though, since at first she starts out as an absolute brat, clinging on to Xiaoran, being a really big annoyance and just being overall cocky brat to Sakura, always trying to be better than her, but getting mad whenever Sakura holds her own. Although Mei Ling does get the most drastic change by the end of the entire series, and even by the end of this arc, we learn quite a lot about Mei Ling. We find out in Mei Ling's last standout episode in this arc, why she's so clingy to Xiao Ran, in addition to having a very awkward romance with him or crush, even though they are siblings. Xiaoran had saved her pet bird at a very young age, and she wasn't very social and actively avoided people. Xiaoran saving her bird really encouraged her to meet more people and really made her respect Xiaoran more. Mailing by the end of the series gets the biggest change, but we're nowhere near that yet. And now for one of the last characters I'll go into for now, who I have a lot to say about, but I will save bits and details regarding this character for later on when I go about the episodes and pacing, though I'll say most of what needs to be said here and now about this character. The smart yet strange teacher Kaho Miyuzuki. She actually is my third favorite character of this entire arc, but not of the entire series. She is Sakura's teacher, introduced a bit halfway through the series when Sakura enters her next grade, and she also works as a shrine maiden at the Tomoeda Shrine, since her father was a priest there. She had been working in England at the time, and she always does look like she has something she wants to say, but never says it. This is because she had formerly been in a relationship with Toya before moving to England for her teaching credential career path, whatever you want to call it. 
Miyuzuki is a really good character, and the only thing that really holds her down is that, well, after this arc, she doesn't nearly get anywhere near as much significance or screen time as later arcs, though her breaking up with Toya and her moments in this arc are all really good. I really do like Kaho Miyuzuki as a character. She's got that smarts, as the teacher should, and that bit of mystic for the Shrine Maiden half. So all's well that ends well. Alrighty then, I'd actually like to apologize for spending nearly 20 minutes on the characters alone, but I did this so I wouldn't have to go into it during the episode and pacing section, and there I can just kind of reference it without having to explain it there. So let's go on to the world, which is our next section. Is that what you do? Chase away all the boys who get near Sakura? Sure, I'm the only one that can tease her. I knew it, you really got a sister complex. Cut it out. Let's talk about the world slash setting. The town of Tomaeda is... Eh, I'm not gonna lie, it's not that great. In my opinion, at least. It is fairly by the books for Japanese towns. It's got your houses, shops, parks, schools, just what you'd expect for this kind of anime. And the areas are very simplistic. Even for the more magical areas or atmospheric areas, it's nothing you don't really see in other animes, and most of it you could even see in real life. Either. CCS doesn't need to be too complicated like Planet Fall Guy or Gunsmoke, and it does try to be more realistic, with the fantasy element being thrown in as something going on behind the scenes in everyday life. And there are some good looking shots, so credit there, but. I'm not gonna lie when I say Tom Ada isn't the most interesting world. There's not many interesting locations. A lot of the places where the card capturing takes place are reused, which is kind of a letdown. And the series just feels like something that you could see every day with the magic going on outside of the public's eye, which is what it tries to go for, but I will admit, for what it could have been, the world could have had more charm to it. And that's it. Like, Tomo is not something I gotta go into great detail about like I did with Gunsmoke or Fall Gaia, so next section! Rika? animation isn't anything mind-blowing, though I did give credit to the developers being able to animate and draw Sakura's many different outfits, it doesn't change the fact that for the time it's fairly average, though it does have its good moments here and there. Now, I am no expert when it comes to animation, I 100% admit that, but there are a few weird shots at times and ways characters' eyes look and stuff like that, but overall, it's good for the most part, and those weird moments are pretty far and few in between, though the times I saw them, I definitely did notice. But even so, I will give credit the anime, apart from the outfit thing I mentioned earlier, does have a good way of fitting various things. Yeah, I mean, the series has the perfect stuff when it comes to emotional, comedic, badass, cool, mysterious, and the animation does for the most part fit all of these, so I'll give credit that the genres are pretty widespread, though I have seen better animation, and even then I have seen better animation at the time. But even so, it's good and it's passable, and that's all I can really ask for. Again, not too much to say in this section, so <laughs> I hate to say this for the ten bajillionth time now, but let's move on to the next thing, I guess. There is a lot I do want to say about the sound, but I'll probably be beating a dead horse if I just rant about the really good soundtrack of this anime, in all honesty. The entirety of the soundtrack is decent, and much like Wild Arms, it has a very wide 
variety of themes and genres. It's got your everyday happy-go-lucky tracks, mysterious themes to emphasize the magical elements, a will-filled, faithful card-capturing tune, doofy tunes to keep you laughing, emotional tracks that might just shed a tear or two, more relaxing tracks to show the everyday life of Tomato, it's got it all, and CCS has a really good soundtrack. Now, I, normally, I would play clips of the sound, but I don't want to get copyrighted considering I'm already using video clips as is, and I don't want to get, you know, blocked or whatever, and I'm gonna get demonetized, obviously, so I won't be able to show any examples, but I will say that of the three animes I've reviewed so far, I'd listen to CCS's soundtrack in a heartbeat over Trigun's and WATV, since it has a little bit of everything. WATV had a really good western vibe, Trigun had a good western vibe too with some tech stuff here and there, but in all honesty, when comparing, ironically, the action scene themes to WATV's and Trigun's especially, CCS beats it out, I think. And I know it's really strange for CCS to have such a good soundtrack, but I mean, to be fair, a lot of animes have trouble with music. Now, not all of them. I have not personally seen an anime with a quote-unquote bad soundtrack. With the exception of one, which I actually will review later, and that anime I refer to is actually another Magic Girl anime, ironically, but I'm not really here to talk about that soundtrack at the current moment. But yeah, CCS has the best soundtrack so far of the three animes I've reviewed so far, and I can list a ton of its tunes in a heartbeat. So, with that said and out of the way, we can finally talk about the story and pacing, as well as the episodes, since there is quite a lot. Someone's there. Who's that? Alrighty then, we're gonna need to blaze through about 46 episodes, so... Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try my best to not make this too long. The pacing of CCS's first arc is a bit of a zigzagger. It gets good, goes bad, gets good, gets bad, and kind of loops on until it gets good again. It starts out good, like I said. Episode 1 has Sakura opening the book. Every card except the Windy card scatters. Kiro awakens. Kiro and Sakura bicker. He turns to the staff. We find a giant mystical being on the loose that happens to be one of the cards. Sakura captures it, gets the new ability of the card, that being the fly card, thanks to the help of the windy card, allowing Sakura to get the fly card back into the captured state, and it ends there. All in all, it's a good first episode, and I'll take it. Episode 2 starts showing off more of the cast, introducing Tomoyo, who quickly finds out about Sakura's magic, but is willing to keep hush-hush about it, as long as she can tag along and film Sakura's heroic deeds, in addition to helping her look more like a magic girl with the costumes she creates for her and Kira. Tomoyo helps Sakura shield a shadow card, who actually looks pretty cool, and I really do like the dark cloak as design, which gives this weird mystic feeling the other cloak cards don't quite have. Episode 3 showcases Sakura's crush on Yukito, showing more banter between Yukito and Toya, and Sakura also seals the watery card in the process of finding out its involvement during a trip to the aquarium. Episode 4 has two Clo cards captured in a single episode, a good idea that I wish was used a bit more, as the series would have dragged a little less as a result. It happens with the giant tree growing in Sakura's help, and she manages to capture both the wood and the rain cards, in addition to finishing her chores before his Fujikara and Toya get home. A little too slow, and definitely the least interesting episode so far. Episode 5 revolves around a shop owner who has a weird problem with stuffed animals. Sakura finds out it's due to the jump card, and quickly seals it off so the shopkeeper can properly run her business. Pretty slow episode, but it is nice to see more of Tomoeda. Episode 6 gives us more insight about Nadashiko. Sakura sees a projection of Nadashiko flying high above a cliff at Tomoeda. 
However, after some of Sakura's friends convince her that Natashiko would not try and send her off of a cliff to her death and in danger, Sakura realizes it's the doing of another cloak card, that being the illusion card. We also see the real angel of Natashiko talk to Toya for a bit, revealing Toya can see magical beings. Again, a little too slow, but works to ease the excitement and is better than episode 4 and 5. Episode 7, though, is a fantastic time, taking place in an art museum where a painting suddenly has a new image inside of it and uses magic to silence and teleport anyone out so their voices don't work. A little child named Tachibana tries to get what they think is a vandalite image out of the painting supposedly created by Tachibana's dead father. Sakura and Tamayo sneak in as well at the middle of the night to run into Tachibana, who tries to get the image out of the painting as well. The two team up for some wacky stealth antics before catching the silence card. It also has a good little twist at the end, thus revealing Tachibana was actually a girl. Plus, Sakura hiding Kiro from Tachibana in ridiculous ways always gets a chuckle out of me. You know, in retrospect, this episode reminds me a bit of the Portrait of Lana episode from WATV. <laughs> I mean, they are both, you know, art episodes now, aren't they? <laughs> and what kind of relationship did you have with him? We were lovers. What did you just say? You were lovers? We also see at the very end Sharon getting a glimpse of Sakura's card capturing action. One of the best episodes so far, in my opinion. Episode 8 has Sakura wake up from the recurring dream she's had since day 1, where she sees Shaoran Lee, or as she calls him, the boy in the Chinese clothing with the sword. He transfers to the school that day, and they both take down the lightning car. Episode 9 is my personal favorite of the first 10 episodes. Sakura, Tomoyo, and a friend from school named Rika go to a store to buy some brooches. Rika, however, is possessed by her pin brooch, which is actually the sword card. Sakura manages to disarm Rika of her sword with the help of the illusion card, and manages to capture the sword card before Shaoran can. Plus, the sword card is one of the more interesting cards since it will definitely help Sakura in the future with her combat, which would also lead to more action scenes, so I'm not complaining. Plus, it's a freaking sword. A sword. Draw your blade! With pleasure. Ford! 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 You good? Episode 10 focuses around a community track event for students and parents alike. It also views Fujikara personally knows Tomoya's mother, named Sonomi, and they share a bit of a rivalry. They compete in a track meet only to be flooded with flower petals. This is due to the flower card. Sakura finds the flower card, but in an admittedly intriguing turn of events, the flower card almost puts up no fight and almost even willingly lets Sakura seal it, since the flower card only wanted to the mood to track me by Shaoran flower petals, showing not every cloak card needs a big encounter, though it is a really slow episode and not that enjoyable to me personally. Episode 11 is also pretty darn slow, and it mainly revolves around Sakura visiting Tomoyo's place and getting on good terms with Sonomi. Tomoyo can't open this box, and the crew figure out thanks to Kiro and Tomoyo, it is due to the use of a Clo card, that being the shield card. Using the sword card, they dispel the barrier around the box, revealing some important items to Tomoyo's family. Pretty slow and boring episode, and not even that great for a pace taming episode, so... Eh. Episode 12 finally brings back the action, with time being constantly rewinded, so Sakura, Kiro, and Lee are the only ones who remember they're reliving the same day at least three times before Sakura and Lee steal the car. However, since Lee was the one that did the most damage before it was captured, the card goes to him and chooses him. The time card is one of the more interesting cards in visual design, and it's a good episode that feels mystical and magical, as the series should. Episode 13 focuses on Sakura's class going to the zoo. It isn't until a card starts breaking stuff that challenges Sakura, that being the power card, to a strength contest in order to capture it. Sakura tries tug of war but is obviously outmatched. Though Lee uses the time card to freeze time and slip the rope out of the power card's hand, making it thinks it lost, therefore allowing it to be sealed by Sakura. Lee does so since the card doesn't run wild and he plans to win them all from Sakura later anyways. 
Episode 14 is a weird one, though. Toya and Yukito's class put on a play for the Culture Festival, and they do Cinderella with Toya ironically getting the role of Cinderella herself, Yukito as the fairy figure, and another girl as the prince. The Mist card interrupts during the climax, managing to damage the set, but Sakura seals it and saves the play from going off the rails. It's a bit goofy, but just a tad too weird for my tastes. Though Toya's totally not having it lines are a laugh though. Better than the slower episodes, but not great. Episode 15 is a pretty boring filler of Persona, which is sad since it's the very first time Kiro really gets a focused episode to himself. Kiro and Sakura get in a fight before Kiro flies off, only to get taken by another little girl named Akane, who manages to run into the float card. Sakura captures the float card, and Akane gives Kiro back to Sakura. Low tier episode, and not a lot going for it, save for the fact that this is Kiro's very first, well, focus episode, but still not that great. Episode 16, however, is a filler episode done right, and it's done phenomenally. Sakura goes to a summer condo for a vacation, and unknowingly runs into her grandfather for the very first time, who gives over a gift left over from Natashiko. The grandfather, Misaki, is a great character who gets a heartwarming scene of seeing a rainbow reminding him of Natashiko, which Sakura conjured thanks to the rain card. There is no clo card encounter here, but really, that's all fine, as this episode really gives me some good emotions, and honestly, I feel pretty bad for Mikasi, and the old man is just such a likable character. This is by far the very best filler episode, and another one of my personal favorites. I mean, I just really think Mikasi is such a kind old man. Episode 17 tries to pick up the action again with Sakura going to the beach and doing a test of courage in the cave, students who entered the cave oddly never returned, and with Lee's reluctant help they steal the cause of the vanishing students, that being the erase card, and even though it returns the action, it's not the best episode, and it's had weird times with the beach setting and young characters, making it hard to watch at times. Episode 18 is another slog with the summer festival arriving, which gives us a chance to see Sakura and Lee simp over Yukido even though he's already with Toya, and it leads to an effortless capture of the glow card. Another boring episode, sadly. <laughs> episode 19 starts out pretty boring with the book report plot, but starts to pick up when the book Sakura tries to find constantly moves thanks to the move card, and they seal it together, not before at the very end, Mei Ling is finally introduced, and we see that Sharon isn't exactly able to handle her very well. It's plot relevant, but not too great, but at least it's good enough. However, episode 20 finally returns to form, with Mei Ling helping Sharon capture cards, even though he specifically asks Mei Ling not to since she has no magical ability. Though she does have good physical support, and the group learn of a strange being challenging strong opponents to fights at night, this being the fight card. Mei Ling tries to hold her own against it, and almost succeeds, but manages to get wear and down. Sakura manages to get the most damage though on the card when using the power card on her staff and clonking it out in one hit, making it rightfully hers. Mei Ling still vows to win and help Xiao Ran. But well, it's a good episode that finally gets back into the flow of things again, and the fight card is one of the more interesting cards that sadly isn't used too late on. Episode 21 is another filler episode done right, but a bit of action is thrown in to give it the charm it needs. A marathon race is being held, and Mei Ling overworks herself in training in hopes of beating Sakura so she can pass the finish line first with Xiao Ran Lee. It also introduces Wang Wei, the caretaker of the Lee Twins. He gives Mei Ling a few pointers on how to get better. The day of the race comes with Sakura, Xiao Ran, Mei Ling all going in the race, only to realize they keep cycling through the same area despite the direction they run. This is all due to the loop card, which Sakura cuts with the sword card, and that seals that. The loop card isn't too special, but it is at least interesting enough, and I will admit it was pretty darn funny to see Mei Ling try so hard to get better, only to fizzle and practice on the very first day. Set. Go! She's fast! That girl. 
They must be amazed at my running abilities. <laughs> Episode 22 is actually very significant, despite maybe looking like a filler episode at first. It further increases the bond with Sakura and her father, Fujikara. We learn about Fujikara's archaeology teaching job, and how he pushes himself very hard to keep the family stable in Natashiko's absence. Sakura steals the sleep card, which will come in handy for having less people notice the weird magic going on in Tomoida, and it's one of the few cards Sakura uses a ton and a ton later in the series, so good on you. Anyways, good episode. Episode 23 spends a good time expanding Tomoyo quite a bit. There are rumors of a singing voice being heard in the music room at night. Sakura, Tomoyo, Kuro, Shaoran, and Mei Ling all investigate with Tomoyo sing to make the song card trust them enough to allow the card capture to seal her. Good episode for Tomoyo especially, and I love it that Tomoyo was actually really useful in the sealing of this card. So, once again, good episode, and Tomoyo does need a few more focus episodes, especially for this late in the series. Now we are on to episode 24, which is a fun little adventure. Quite literally. Sakura gets shrunk and has to find a way back to her normal size. She gets chased around by cats, bugs, and has to deal with everyday objects for us appearing like skyscrapers. She eventually catches a little card, sealing it, making her realize a big castle like home might not be as great as it seems. I also like this as a small episode where we take a bit of a break from the Shao Round and Mei Ling, making this episode pretty entertaining for a pace breaker and a bottle episode being contained in Sakura's house. Episode 25 does a good job showing more what Toya thinks of Sakura and how he encounters the Mirror Card, who pretends to be Sakura, who causes mischief around town and even leads Toya into a dangerous situation. However, Toya knows the Mirror Card is not actually Sakura since he can sense Natashiko's angel, thus showing he has some magical power himself. This also even gives the Mirror Card a good little redemption, with even Toya forgiving the Mirror Card, even if Sakura was absolutely livid. The mirror card also tries to redeem herself by giving Sakura a massive hint on how to seal it as atonement for its rascally actions. This is also where Toya finally confirms he knows Sakura has more going on. Episodes 26 and 27 introduce Miyuzuki, the new teacher. She starts on good terms with Sakura, but as you can probably see, Shao Ran is rather unsettled around her, as he is suspicious of Miyuzuki being the new grade teacher, in addition to being the Shrine Lady. Sakura, Tomoyo, Kuro, Shao Ran, and Mei Ling go to visit the shrine Miyuzuki works at, only to get lost in a giant maze that shifts around as they try to escape. After many failed tactics, to try and walk or break out of the maze, Miyuzuki manages to get the group out thanks to a magic bell she has in her hand that allows her to break through the walls because it has some sort of ridiculously strong magical power. It's a great time with Miyuzuki showing her more mysterious side and just being a great moment for all the characters. It also shows us that Toya knew Miyuzuki, but we don't find that until 27, which I'll get into right now. In episode 27, it starts out with Sakura's recurring dream showing a mysterious woman atop Tokyo Tower who shares a similar resemblance to an obvious other character. This episode then shows more about Miyuzuki and Toya, and how they were in a romantic relationship before Miyuzuki had to move to England for, you know, getting or teaching credentials. This was explained in the process of recapturing the Return card, which thanks to Shaoran, using the Time card, allowed Sakura to escape the timeline and capture the return card, with Sakura being the keeper of the spot. Another good bit to the Miyuzuki arc, and overall a great time just to see Toya in a younger state. 
It also further shows that not only does Miyuzuki's bell have ridiculously high magical power, but Miyuzuki herself actually has some pretty high magical power as well, as shown by her watching the group at the very, very end. Hinting there's more to her. Spooky! Episode 28 is an okay filler episode that at least does give more clarity to the shopkeeper back in episode 5 with a new product line of cards. Mei Ling unknowingly buys an actual Klo card, that being the Shot card. The Shot card attacks Lee, but thanks to Sakura using the Mirror card to reflect its projectiles back at it, Sakura seals it. I do like it that it does give clarity to the shopkeeper, and the Shot card is one of the more threatening powers. Episode 29 is a letdown, as it's another filler episode with one of the most situational cards in the series, the Sweet Card, which turns things into sweets and or just adds sugar to stuff, making it tasty. Really lame and is almost never used and is really not that interesting of an episode. So, uh, another decrease in quality, but I guess it is cute to see the more kitchen aesthetics and the outfits they do wear in the cooking episode are cute, I guess. Yes, but this episode doesn't have much going for it, though. Episodes 30 and 31 are amazing. Episode 30 has the dash card, nearly captured by Sakura and Shaman at the start, but manages to find its way into a girl named Ray's house, where she tends to its wounds and takes care of it, thinking of it as a pet. Sakura hesitates to seal it, but has to or else it won't really work. However, the card goes to Shao Ran since he did most of the damage, but Shao Ran does manage to show his heart here by letting the girl see the bet. Episode 31 has Sakura capturing the big card, which is another good one since it almost willingly lets Sakura capture it, which is again, something I like, but it also goes back to episodes 4, where it had revealed two cloak cards in the same episode, that being the create card, where a girl unknowingly gets a book that allows her to write stuff into existence, where Sakura battles a great big dragon and steals the create card. Good episode. Episode 32 is a body swap story where Kiro and Shaoran switch bodies, and it works as a good goofy episode and one of Kiro's better focused episodes when they capture the change card. And I also like it that they have to wait a bit before they change, or else this story would be over in about two seconds. Episodes 33 and 34 are mid-tier. 33 is all fine and dandy with the ice skating setup, showing one of the more dangerous glow cards, that being the freeze card, in addition to showing Miyuzuki's more mysterious side as she herself is not frozen. The fight with the freeze card is a decent action scene where Sakura and Shaoan more willingly team up since everyone is frozen, including Mei Ling and Tamoyo, except for them, and of course Miyuzuki, who they don't notice. This also further just shows Shaoran's initial suspicions were true. This is also where Shaoran gets starts to gain his feelings for Saku. Episode 34 is a weird one though. Much like episode 16, there is not a Klo card in counting here, though there is plot significance with the tag tournament quiz team with Sakura and Yukito being paired together for more of their bond, as well as Miyuzuki being one of the staff members, hinting at Miyuzaki's knowledge of the full moon. We do see another clip of Sakura's dream, but not much changes say for seeing a bit more of the mysterious woman in Sakura's dream, who, as you can probably guess, is Miyuzuki. The most noteworthy scene, however, is how Kiro looks at the full moon and mentions the name of another person he knows called Yue. I do appreciate the plot's significance, and it is quite entertaining, but it is a little hard to watch since it is a bit slow. Episode 35 is the Christmas special, where Sakura and Lee using the sleep card at theme park so they can capture the fiery card, who is one of the better fights. As well as capturing the fiery card gives Kiro back some of his magical power, allowing him to use fire, and gives him one step closer to getting to his true form. We also do see Miyuzuki more on the side, but she isn't really that much of a focus. We also get to see Sakura and Yukito up in the ferris wheel as she starts to tell Yukito more about how she feels for him, and we even see Sakura give Yukito a gift, which is nice. It is a good scene and a good way to end the first season. Of course, it's not the end of the arc, though. 
Episode 36 is another good addition to Sakura and Yukito's relationship. It gives more build up to Miyazuki's true involvement with another dream sequence, in addition to having Miyazuki hinting she knows the cold weather is constantly intensifying in a strange manner. Sakura encounters the cause of the snow constantly intensifying, that being the snow cup, for obvious reasons, but this makes her lose the watch that Yukito gave her for Christmas. Shower and Lee, out of pity, offers to help Sakura look for the watch, only for Miyazuki to mysteriously appear and hand it to her, saying she found it. This makes Sakura respect Miyazuki more, while only adding more unease to Shaoran's thoughts. Good mirror to her episode, showing more of the sympathetic side of Shaoran, the more mysterious side of Miyazuki, and showing the contrast of how Miyazuki is seen in the eyes of Sakura and Shaoran Lee. Good mirror to her episode overall. Episodes 37 and 38 are just kind of okay though. 37 is very similar to the episode of the song card. Instead of Tomoyo using the new card introduced in this episode, it's because of Tomoyo falls victim to the card. That being the voice card that steals her voice. So the group used the song card to attract the voice card, seal the voice card up, and give Tomoyo back her voice. It's very similar to the song card episode, but eh. Episode 38 focuses on Sakura picking a bunch of strawberries, only to get trapped in a warehouse. This is thanks to the lock card, which she seals fairly quickly, and it's just kind of eh. I mean, I really didn't find it that interesting, not gonna lie. It wasn't terrible, but not great by any means. Definitely one of the lower mid-tier episodes. Episode 39 is a decent episode where the cloud card causes Sakura to become ill and she needs to find a way to capture it before Toya finds out she's gone. So she uses the mirror card to have it pretend to be her, but Toya quickly notices but decides to keep quiet about it. Sakura seals the cloud card and after the day is done and Toya decides to keep quiet about the mirror card, even comforting the mirror card itself, asking it to keep pretending to be Sakura so she doesn't know, Nanashiko's ghost comes and heals Sakura from her illness, and Toya sees this too. A good little episode, and I do like it that Toya even talks to Nanashiko's angel a bit this time, showing that he does in fact have the ability to see that. Episode 40 is another good time, revealing more of Sakura's dream, and it also showcases more of Shaogran's feelings towards Sakura that he tries to keep hidden. The dream card is the focus this time, and this is what causes Sakura to see more of a recurring dream she's had since the very, very first episode. It also hints towards the final climax, with Miyuzuki on the rooftop of the Tokyo Tower, and referring to something called the Final Judgment. Also, Shaogran ultimately wins the dream card, so Sakura can't just use the dream card to see more of her dream, which is a decent explanation, I'll admit, since if she did get the dream card and didn't use it, I'd be like, well, what the heck. So I like it that Shaowan gets the dream card, since it makes sense, since that way Sakura can't just cheat and see the rest of her dream and spoil everything. Episodes 41 and 42 are okay plot significant episodes. Both episodes focuses on Sakura's class putting on a play of Sleeping Beauty. Shaoran, ever suspicious of Miyuzuki, has to play along for him. Shaoran ironically draws the role of the princess, meaning he has to cross-dress, and Sakura gets the prince, meaning she too has to cross-dress and kiss him at the end. Episode 41 focuses on the practicing, ending with the encounter of the sand card, with Shaoran getting a card, while episode 42 is the actual day of the play itself. And, much like a few other episodes that, again, I really wish they did this more, we have two different flow cards attack at the same time or within the same episode, which is nice. Those being the dark and light cards, who have some of the biggest plot significance but are sadly, sadly, not used in the slightest bit until the very end. And that's not even during this arc, as they don't even serve that much purpose in this arc. Although we do see Kiro mention Yue again, saying he'll finally reunite with Yue, in addition to showing Mizuki is even more mysterious than ever. And overall, it's a fine episode pair, I guess, just not as good as others, and, well... Uh, once again, much like the Toya and Cinderella episode, having Sakura cross-dress and put on 
Sleeping Beauty is a bit weird for my liking. But at least Mizuki's better than ever. Yeah, it'll be okay for sure, right? Episode 43 is the very last standalone episode before the three-part climax finale. And this is also the episode where it's revealed that Mei Ling had to crush on Sharon because of the bird story. And also Mei Ling unfortunately has to move back to Hong Kong after finally getting along and coming to terms with Sakura recently. Mei Ling and Sharon get into a bit of a scuffle and argue, but at the very least, Sakura does cleverly get them back together by having Mei Ling feel useful by helping Sharon capture the twin pod. In one of the more intriguing action fights, with Mei Ling and Xiao Ran both doing good jobs at holding off the twin card, in addition to having Mei Ling feel useful during these glow card encounters, even with the lack of magical ability. Also, Mei Ling does get a pretty heartwarming end, saying goodbye to Xiao and Sakura. Rather than leaving full of tears, she does leave with a smile, and I do like it. And it's not the end of her, she does come back in later episodes and later arcs, but I will say this is a good end for her character arc. So, all's well that ends with well. And I'm glad that Mei Ling at least wasn't the same brat she was at the start of the series, so I will willingly take it. Okay, I need to take a break because I need a bit of time to think about what I'm going to say about the last three episodes. Hmm... Alright, I got it. This is definitely going to be one of the longest episode descriptions ever, though. so brace yourself. Alrighty then, now we can start the three-part finale. Episode 44 has Sakura go into her recurring dream yet again. I've said it before, and I will say it again. I always love these scenes. Usually in magical animes, dreams are always of hopeful, or future, or powers, or goody good stuff, but I like that Sakura's dreams are all mysterious, and here she finally realizes the woman in her dream is Miyuzuki, though she sees something else. She sees a winged person with silver hair standing where Miyuzuki used to be. Sakura doesn't want to believe Miyuzuki is pulling the strings, but Kiro clearly has something on his mind after hearing this from Sakura but he also can't quite say it to Sakura yet. I really do love this dream sequence, as we really get to see more of Miyuzuki in this mysterious gray figure. Plus, the wing fluttering in the wind just looks so cool, if you ask me. So yeah, Sakura wakes up late as usual. I mean, it's happened in nearly every episode, so why would it not happen in the finale as well? I also like it that they make the finale seem normal at the start, but it quickly, and I mean quickly, gets odd. Sakura goes to see Yukito participate in an archery festival. On the way there, since the archery festival is near the Tokyo Tower, Sakura sees it and obviously recognizes the same place in her dream. Shaoran and Tomoyo are obviously piked and want to know what's going on in Sakura's mind, with Kiro referring to Yue once again, saying the time to meet Yue is close to come. It's clear the cute little guarding the sun knows more about Yue than we do, but we will get to that when we get to that. I actually really do like the scene with Yukito in the arching tournament. It's just, I don't know, it's like, I wouldn't call it an action scene per se, but given how it's more upbeat and we get to see Yukito in action, it might as well be an action scene. Plus, Yukito's actually a pretty good archer, not gonna lie. Things start getting interesting when Yukito makes it to the championship round, where his opponent is... Miyuzuki. At this point, a very tense archery match goes on, with Miyuzuki and Yukito both hitting the bullseye. And in this type of tournament, whoever misses their target first or gets a lesser point first loses. So, it's a battle of endurance. And it's actually pretty neat, with both of them constantly hitting the bullseye one after the other, meaning whoever screws up first is the loser. It'll just keep on going. And it's really cool. Technically speaking, it's not an action scene, but given seeing Yukito with a bow and the fact that Cardcaptor Sakura didn't really have much action in the human scenes, I'll consider this an action scene. However, Kiro senses magical power on Miyuzuki, 
However, Miyazuki picks up on Kuro sensing her, and this causes her to throw the last shot. After the fight, well, I'm sorry, tournament, because it's not really a fight because they're not shooting arrows at each other, Kuro sneaks off from the picnic with Yukido and the rest of Sakura's friends to talk with Miyuzuki face to face. Kuro asks Miyuzuki if she knows of Yue, the other guardian, since remember, Kuro is the guardian of the sun, and Yue obviously would have to be the guardian of the moon. Kuro talks to Miyuzuki for a bit, but before that can really go anywhere, a large earthquake strikes the area, thus prompting Sakura and her friends to go after it, this being the very last clone card, the Earth card. And the episode ends just as the Earth card strikes. For the first bit of the climax, it's pretty well played. Mizuki and Yukito both got some of their best moments yet, and I like it how it starts out normal with Sakura waking up late, but it obviously gets more weird. Episode 45 is the process of Sakura capturing the Earth card. Using the sleep card to put most people to sleep, including Yukido, but oddly enough not Miyuzuki or Tomoyo, Sakura manages to capture the Earthy card with the help of the Watery card, Hiro using his fire magic from the fire card, and using the wood card to ultimately seal it off and finally get it back to its true form. The Earthy card is one of the cooler looking cards, by the way, in its true form, so credit there. And this finally allows Kiro to turn back to his true form, which I'm not gonna lie when I say Kiro's true form is actually pretty cool looking, not gonna lie. I mean, at least compared to the other stuff we've seen so far. And his voice even changes too, which is a nice touch. I also like that his voice goes back and forth when going from his dormant state to his true state. However, it's not over yet, as Sakura goes back to the foot of the tower to see Mizuki carrying her magic bell. Hiro, in his true form called Kirberos, reveals once Sakura signs her name on the cards, she and Sharon will be tested to see who is worthy of being the master. And then, one of the best scenes happens. This is the final judgment. <gasps> That's you. That's you? You know what? I'm not gonna lie. This was a pretty good twist. Now, I will admit Miyuzuki got all of the build up, and we were supposed to think Miyuzuki was Yue. But really, he was Yukita that was Yue. Now, I know what you're probably thinking if you saw the other episodes. Oh, this is where you're gonna pull a Gina slash the masked woman slash Lila in WA TV for not being the final fight, or how Legato Blusen was, how they should have gotten the final fight despite all this good. Well, no, actually. Honestly, I can kind of blame myself for this one. And Gene, him too. But the main reason why I'm actually very understanding, and I'm even actually not that really upset that Miyuzuki isn't the big final confrontation, or Yue itself, is because, well, just think about it. One, yes, Miyuzuki was shown always in the dreams, and she had been watching Sakura capture the cloak cards, but if she really wanted to do something to Sakura to improve or endanger her magical abilities, why didn't she do anything during all the cloak card encounters? 
She even saved Sakura from the maze card, so that doesn't really check out. And also, the bell. How would she really use that in a fight? So, honestly, I'm fine with Miyuzuki not being the big final threat. Plus, Yue, which is the true form of Yukito, as you just saw. Oh my goodness, he looks so cool. I love the silver-esque angel design, and the personality shift making him more cold and almost merciless is really, really cool. And we have a fight scene that is absolutely amazing to boot. Sakura is actually pretty upset with Kiro, since Kiro this entire time told Sakura once she captured all the glow cards, or all the glow cards were captured, she could avoid the great tragedy. But Kiro had never said anything about Yue being the final guardian, and the final test. Kiro admits it wasn't easy to lie to Sakura like that, but it was the only way she'd make it this far if she had the motivation to do so. Sakura's come too far, but she has to go through with anyways. Shaoran is the first to face off against Yue, and Yue easily trashes Shaoran, even with his possession of some glow cards. And man, Yue is absolutely booking it, not hesitating at all to shoot crystals, punch, and even just outright fly up and smack Shaoran by the back of the head, even using the time card against him, since the time card falls under the moon's jurisdiction. And this is when Sakura is finally allowed to have a chance. But since Shaolin is defeated, Sakura was given all of Shaolin's cards. Since Shaolin is not fit, therefore Yu A gives them to Sakura. And this sets up the epic final battle, which will take up most of episode 47. And overall, it just sets it up so well. Episode 46 is the great big final fight between Sakura and Yue, and it is an excellent climax. I mean, oh my gosh. Yue doesn't have that much screen time, but he's a very valid threat, forcing Sakura to fight him even though she really bloody doesn't want to, because she knows if she hurts Yue, Yukito, his other persona, will be damaged as well. And remember, Sakura has a crush on Yukito, and Yu Yukito has a friend. So she doesn't want to hurt him, but Yue, oh man, he does not hesitate to strike back and tosses Sakura around like a rag doll on the top of Tokyo Tower. He goes all out, flying, throwing crystals, shooting energy bow stuff. It's just, oh my goodness, it's an amazing final fight. And Sakura constantly runs away from Yukito, trying to get enough time to find some sort of idea to try and beat Yue without hurting him. But Yue will not just let her run away and get time to think, so he relentlessly chases after her and continues the pressure. These motion shots are amazing. I love how the scene just swerves and flies as, you know, Sakura's trying to escape Yue. The Ice Crystal animation's great. This is just an overall excellent action scene and really good, surprisingly, for a magic girl anime. Plus, seeing Sakura get trashed is, well, not gonna lie, pretty darn tense. And here's Yue making it look like this is all too easy, and is completely cold and merciless, unlike Yukito, which really affects Sakura emotionally. Sakura finally gets the idea to use the wood card to try and keep Yue from moving, but unfortunately, the wood card falls under the moon's jurisdiction, meaning Yue can control the wood card and turn it against Sakura. So the vines that were originally intended to try and wrap up Yue go and wrap Sakura instead. And I would complain as this is obviously a bit kinky, but I mean, I guess I can understand why since it isn't really easy to come up with a non-lethal way to fight the final boss of this anime, so I guess it makes sense. As Sakura is bound in vines, Yue reveals that Sakura will not beat him, and that the great tragedy that will occur will happen since Sakura failed. Everyone related to the Clow Cart would forget their existence, in addition to not remembering any of the strong feelings they cared for so they don't crutch on others. Sakura, obviously, is mortified by this, 
this, this means everyone she loved, and everyone that loved the people she knew, would not have the same feelings for her. And this doesn't just apply to her, this applies to her father, her brother, friends at school, and it's pretty honestly dark. Even though it's really indirect, it is really dark since as Sakura is being choked and wrapped in a cocoon of vines, she suddenly wakes up in her bed and we just see what life would be like if nobody remembered Sakura or their feelings for those they cared for most. And ironically, Sakura still remembers in this sequence, but I guess it just adds to the emotion as Sakura sees everyday life, people not treating her like, you know, a friend or a family member, just treating her like an everyday run-of-the-mill person. And it's so, it's, it's, it's not like the worst thing ever, but it's really interesting. It seems like a very normal day at school for everyone else, but Sakura sees all the relations they had with one another are completely gone. Kiro is absent, Yukito is absent, and you can just see the despair and how much she misses the magic and happiness of her life she had before. It isn't until she goes into a bamboo forest where we see her cry, missing all of the fun she had in life. That is, until the song card suddenly appears and sings the same song Tomoyo sang a few episodes back. Silhouettes of Sakura's friends appear in the background as she remembers what's important to her. And then, in a very impactful scene, Sakura sees Yukido. Sakura knows inside what she must do and what she has to be. However, it's then revealed as soon as she hears Miyuzuki's bell, which allows her to break free from the vines and escape the distorted reality, much to the shock of Yue. It's then revealed that Miyuzuki's bell had been created by Clo Reed. Clo Reed himself had made this bell, so if Sakura managed to get beaten by Yue, she'd get one final chance to beat Yue before suffering the tragedy that she saw. Miyuzuki says Sakura has to believe in herself, and not to use Clo Reed's magic and find her own magic. Sakura's newly found confidence allows her to finally face Yue, in addition to her staff of all, which is a pretty cool scene, not gonna lie. Sakura, with her new staff, with more magical power connected to her, finally gives her the strength to use the Windy card. However, you initially mock Sakura for attempting to use the Windy, as it too falls under the Moon type's jurisdiction. However, Sakura's new staff gives her greater control over the card, meaning Yue can't turn Windy against her making Windy restrain Yue and put him in a binding of wind, allowing Sakura to win. Sakura, however, then approaches Yue and says she sees that he really cared for Clo Reed to go this far and protect his legacy. Sakura tells Yue she doesn't want to replace Clo Reed. She wants to be her. And most importantly, she doesn't want to act as the master over Yue and Kiro like Clo Reed did. Instead, she wants to be their friend. This finally causes Yue to see the truth and resolve in Sakura, as he concedes and allows Sakura to become the new master of the Clone Cards. As the title is endowed upon Sakura, she sees the projection of Clo Reed's ghost, who tells Sakura she made the right decision in believing herself and trying to live up to Clo Reed himself. Clo Reed also tells Sakura the new key staff she made is now composed of her own magical power that will bond with her very own star, rather than the sun and moon that Clo Reed used. Clo tells her that it might start out small, but her star will continue to grow as she evolves and becomes stronger. Sakura, thanks to the spirit of Clo Reed, returns to the real world where Tomoyo, Shaoran, and everyone else cheer for her at Sakura becoming the new master. Toya had been watching from afar the whole time, revealing he too is a means of the sleep card, and Miyuzuki approaches Toya and asks him if he knew what was going on. Toya confirms saying yes, but he's proud that Sakura managed to complete the trial. Yue and Kirberos decide to stay with Sakura in their borrowed forms, Kiro and Yukito, just a bit longer to keep watch over her as her star grows and she can control her own magic. Sakura looks at Yue turned back to Yukito and smiles happily, in which Sakura too smiles back. 
And that is the end of the very first arc of Cardcaptor Captain Sakura, the Clow Card Arc. The final encounter with Yue was a great action scene. I mean, honestly, it was a hell of a lot better than the Keanu and Cheyenne finale, and while the Knives vs. Bash fight was obviously better for having more varied combat methods and the fact that Bash hit Knives more than once, and Sakura only really hit Yukito with the Windy Color, but it was really nice to see Sakura in one of her most desperate situations yet. I also like it that Sakura was so desperate in fact that she really had to use a lot of flow cards compared to her other encounters. This is one of the few times where she wouldn't be able to use two or three cards and get away with it. Here she used at least five. She was forced to use the jump card to get to the top of the tower, she used the fly card to escape UA, she used the wood card to try and strike first, the song card activated on its own to keep her motivated, and the windy card was finally used to defeat UA. And really, I like this, since Sakura had only used two or three cards at max for some episodes, and more than often than not, she just used one. So, I like it that Sakura was really forced to use a lot more than her normal desired amount of cards. But let's get to the conclusion. I will admit that it is a little rushed that the battle, once it ends, it ends as well. We don't really get to see every character wrapped up, but I mean, I can't really blame the anime for that, as this is the first arc, which means they're going to cover more of that in later arcs. I loved Miyuzuki's mysterious buildup and magical threat. Yukido being UA wasn't amazing. Kirberos looks really cool in his true form. And the final fight was great and it ends happily. All in all, I love the series quite a bit. Though I will admit it did drag at times. There were a few episodes I kind of had to speed through, not gonna lie. Now, I didn't skip any episodes outright. But there were quite a few episodes that I just watched back to back to get over this so I can continue getting to the good parts. And Yue isn't exactly a villain. I mean, he's an antagonist, sure, but I wouldn't say he was a villain because really he just wanted to keep Clo Reed's legacy to, well, Clo Reed. And that's kind of the funny thing about CCS, as we don't really get a true villain until the very last arc. Now, the movies, there might be a villain there, but still. And in CCS, there are threats and there are antagonists, but not really a true villain again until the very end. I mean, the threats were all the cards, the Lee twins when they were rivals, Miyuzuki first, and Yue himself, obviously. But none of them had evil intent per se. And we'll get to who the true villain is later on, but the antagonists were all entertaining, even if they weren't exactly <laughs> evil, they were still really entertaining. It's a surprise, considering CCS manages to feel threatening even with the lack of a true villain, but I guess that's a strength of its own, I guess. At the end of the day, the Cloak Card arc is a really good introduction, and it does suffer from pacing issues making it not that great of an arc overall, and I have seen better Magic Girl anime arcs, but I'm not gonna lie when I say this is a really good Magical Girl anime, and the arc being weaker at first is only run-of-the-mill. You're not gonna have a 10 out of 10 arc on the very first run, and the fact that it managed to be this good definitely says something. This is why I will give the Clo Card arc a 7.4 out of 10. I'm Quinn866, have a good one, and to celebrate something a little newer, I'm going to add some bloopers at the end of this, so enjoy some bloopers. <laughs> Normally, oh, oh my goodness, my hair. Okay, I'll deal with it. Normally, I would... Gosh, I can't take myself seriously when my hair is like this. Now let's talk about the world. The city, or, well, I guess not really a city. That's what I get for not reading the script, I guess. Alright, now I think it's time for me to go into the other characters. I mean, after all, I haven't really... Uh... Um... Excuse me. 
Like, excuse me. Look, excuse me. God, why? I guess blinker food really goes through your bank. I'll just trim out the earlier parts of it. Alright, with that said and out of the way, let. I really should have scripted this ahead of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, now that we've, uh, the saying uh, in the middle doesn't sound very professional. <laughs> Dang it! Ah! Okay, okay, okay. Um, look at the bird. Let's see. I should have scripted this out ahead of time. God, I'm wasting so much recording space here. Okay, um... All right, now let's talk about more. Oh, uh, God, this is going to be a blooper reel of its own. Okay, okay. All right, I think now that I've covered most of the basic stuff, we can go more into detail about the character relations. I just sent. Oh. I'm done. Okay. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Alrighty then, with the basic character descriptions and relations out of the way, I think we can go a bit more deeper into. Wow, why is this so hard for me? I was recording the rest of this perfectly fine. Okay. Okay. Weird position. All right, with the main. <sighs> Note to self don't even try memorizing the script. Just have it right in front of you so you can read it on the side, even if your eyes dart around when recording. All right, now that we've gotten the main cast of. That's actually not what the script said. And now that you're following the script! God! Why? Oh my gosh! It's, why is this one part, like, throwing me off? God. I'm gonna make a blooper reel of this, I swear. I, I, I have to. There, there's just no question. Alright, with these characters said and out of the way, and the relations said and out of the way, I think we can go into more details about, I just said, with the characters out of the way. Oh my god. <coughs> All this testing is actually kind of making me thirsty. All right, well, with the basic rundown of... There. Gosh, all this recording is actually making me thirsty. I'm going to have to refill this afterwards. I mean, it's not exactly like... I mean, it's not the biggest bottle in the world, but I meant to record all this and... Maybe I should really refill this. I might as well finish it first. I mean, Blinker Fluid is the most horrible drink of all time. No! No!